I don't think. Now, speaking about loonies for a second, um, you, uh, we've mentioned Ron Paul a few times, and uh, Percy, I feel that he doesn't necessarily represent the libertarian ideology exactly, because he has a lot of these sort of uh, NAFTA-hating, uh, World Trade Organization-fearing, UN-fearing crazies, I'd call them, uh, in his movement. I mean, what do you, what do you argue about that? I mean, are, are well, you a Paul supporter? No individual politician is likely to reflect everything I would like to see in, in, in a politician. Uh, I guess if I ran, then I would agree with myself. But anybody else, I probably won't agree with on everything. I think that most of what Ron Paul talked about in his campaign was the war, and he criticized the war from a traditionally conservative, anti-statist position. He and then he also talked about big government and sound money and traditional libertarian issues. He did come across as kind of a protectionist and an immigrant opponent, and he attracted people who had those attitudes. I don't think he is actually a protectionist. And what he would say is, I'm for real free trade. And you can't tell me that a 2,000-page NAFTA agreement is free trade. And he's got a point. A free trade agreement with Canada would take one page. We won't have tariffs anymore. Um, instead, it's 2,000 pages, and that tells you that it's a bunch of politicians managing trade. Nevertheless, here at the Cato Institute, we do say NAFTA means more trade than not having NAFTA, and that's a good thing. That means it is a more liberal regime than if we didn't have it. So I think Ron Paul is wrong to oppose it. But he would say he's opposing it because it isn't really free trade. Some of his concern about American sovereignty, I mean, he's, he's worried there's going to be a highway running from Canada to Mexico and this will destroy American sovereignty. <laughs> You're right. I think that tails off into sort of right-wing conspiracy theory. And for that reason, he was never a favorite of most of my friends here at the Cato Institute or at Reason Magazine, even though um, neither were any of the other candidates. Um, so if, if, I, if I'd had a chance, uh, I probably would have voted for him. But I didn't like the way he was mixing libertarian ideas up with what seemed to be pandering to protectionist and anti-immigrant sentiment. Well, I have a, just a random question about the role of government in our lives, because my roommate and I were discussing uh, government's role last night versus in our individual lives versus its role in society, and we talked from like the abuse of the necessary and proper clause to just state-mandated car checkups. And it just got on this topic of like, you know, us have being required annually, for instance, in Texas, to have our car go in for tune-up and emission standards. Are these standards on emissions um, and safety constitutional? And if not, uh, could you say they're at least practical as the abuse of individuals of simple safety can entail uh, great third-party costs and not merely individual consequence through responsibility? Like, would you advocate that the, it's okay if the government mandated, you know, these annual checkups, or is that too much and why uh, of the role of the government? Of all the things government is doing to us, that one strikes me as a pretty mild and unobjectionable right, right. Uh, imposition. You know, the government tells us to give it 40% of our income. They tell us where we have to send our kids to school. They create this whole war on drugs. Now they're creating a war on tobacco smoking. Um, there are a lot of things that I think are clearly impositions on our individual responsibility to make our own choices. I was just think curious about where you the, draw the, the line. That's the, all. Well, okay, and I'm going to draw you one right here. The government runs the roads, and whoever runs the roads has a responsibility to make them reasonably safe. Not perfectly safe, that's not possible, but to, to ex exercise some safety standards. So the idea that way out libertarians would oppose traffic lights, no they wouldn't. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. You can't have roads without traffic lights. and so. You might say that a radical libertarian would want to privatize the roads and let private companies run them. But whoever runs the roads is going to set some safety standards. Right. My guess is if the roads were run by a private company, they'd be a lot safer than they are. Um, so I'm not bothered by the safety things. Emissions is a little more difficult. But the safety thing absolutely means that the road will be safe when I'm driving on it, and, and you might be making me unsafe, and so it's reasonable to protect me on the government's roads from your possibly driving unsafely or in a dangerous car. Emissions is a little more complicated, because there you really are getting into something that, that looks like a public good. How do we make the environment 
clean enough for all of us without destroying the economy. And I'm not enough of an expert to know if these state emission standards are necessary. And it might be that they make sense in the city of Chicago and they're kind of ridiculous in rural Illinois because, you know, in rural Illinois there's fewer cars and more air and, and so it just doesn't matter. Um, but I think the safety standards are about that. Now, I'll tell you an imposition that I think is unreasonable, and that's the requirement to wear a seatbelt. Because my wearing a seatbelt makes me safer, but it doesn't make you any safer, and therefore it should be my choice in the same way that whether I eat high-fat ice cream should be my choice, Beautiful. not your choice. I so agree with that. Eating high-fat ice cream, I think we can all agree with that one. Um, on this, uh, I'll just ask this, uh, uh, sort of, I guess, a last encompassing question. Um, would you say that the you said there's about a, a hundred thousand as you would call them uh, intellectual libertarians um, would you say that there's this massive populist strain in both parties in the sense you have the blue collar sort of base of the Dems and this kind of immigrant bashing religious base in the right would you, how would you say that there could be a way to overcome that obstacle like I would argue this is more of a populist country than a libertarian one well uh, there, there certainly is that populist strain. Um, I'll tell you one way we overcome it. The, the more libertarian-leaning uh, elements of the population tend to be better educated, more articulate, therefore to, to carry more weight in public dialogue and in elections. And so even if they're, you know, if you have 50% populist versus 40% libertarians, the libertarians might still win because they are better. They, they can organize better. They're more articulate. They're more educated. Um, I think what you can see, though, is that in both parties, you also have a significant number of people who could be considered fiscally conservative and socially tolerant. We did a poll, and we found that 59% of the respondents said, yes, I could be described as fiscally conservative and socially liberal. And a lot of people on the left and the right complain about that fact that both parties, you know, if you look at Bill Clinton, his administration was fairly socially liberal and fiscally not so crazy. Um, and if you look at the Bush administration, it didn't really engage in all the excesses of the religious right that people might have. So in a lot of ways, one way I like to put it, and I think I got this formulation from Mark Lilla at the University of Chicago, is the 60s and the 80s both happened. And in the 60s, we had all kinds of social and cultural liberation. And in the 80s, we had a lot of economic liberation. And we've never repealed either one of those decades. We've nipped at them and we've pushed back and so on. But even Obama doesn't want to go back to 70% tax rates. And McCain is not talking about women going back in the kitchen and gays going back in the closet. So in very broad ways, the fiscally conservative, socially liberal individualist sense of Americans is continuing to open up our society both economically and culturally and that's part of the message of the politics of freedom is it's not as depressing as libertarians often think well thank you so much Mr. Bose for your time um, get the new book it's out this week the politics of freedom we thank you for coming on University of Chicago radio the boiling point um, and we thank you for your work sir you have a nice day thank, thank you. you you too